friends welcome to this pediatrics recall session of the neat pg 2022 exams that were held today i hope you were able to perform to the best of your expectations and this time as we can gather from the students the paper was uh, relatively moderate neither very easy nor very tough the pediatrics questions were very very straightforward and uh, you know most of the questions we've already covered in our videos and notes so i'm sure you've been able to answer them correctly so just a quick uh, you know discussion of the questions which i have been able to gather from you all till now so if there is any change in the question exact language or the options if you feel so you might you know mention them in the comments okay so let's start with the first question what we have here is an infant who presented with developmental delay so an infant with developmental delay okay and is admitted to icu with recurrent episodes of abnormal movements okay and the eeg of this patient showed hip arrhythmia what will be the drug of choice now for answering this question of course you need to know the diagnosis first only then you can comment about the drug of choice so what you are getting here is hip arrhythmia pattern on eeg developmental delay and some abnormal movements which probably in this case will be infantile spasms and we all know the triad of infantile spasms developmental delay or intellectual disability and hip arrhythmia which is a chaotic pattern on the electroencephalogram the diagnosis here undoubtedly is west syndrome and we all know as we have discussed in our videos the drug of choice for west syndrome is injection acth or adrenocorticotropic hormone okay while the drug of choice for infantile spasms in a child with tuberous sclerosis we all know is bigabatrin right moving ahead to the next question so this is again a pretty straight forward question this we have again discussed identify this congenital abnormality seen in a newborn baby so what you see here is uh, you know the lower part of the abdomen of the baby and you see something which is you know a mucosa is protruding from the lower abdomen the umbilical cord attachment has shifted a bit down from its usual location so what you can see here is the moist look looking mucosa and there is probably some fluid clear fluid which is dribbling from there so this is a moist looking red mucosa in the lower abdomen so what you see here friends is the mucosa of the bladder inside the urinary bladder and the umbilical cord attachment has also shifted down okay so this is what you get in bladder extrophy okay which we have discussed in the congenital malformations of the kidney and urinary tract so here the bladder mucosa is exposed to outside the umbilical cord attachment has shifted down the pubic rami are widely separated in males there is complete epispadias okay and there will be also you know the anal malformations can also be associated with it this and these babies have complete incontinence of urine okay and there is an increased risk of bladder adenocarcinoma later on also so what you need to do immediately is wrap up this area with a you know plastic cling wrap kind of a thing to keep this area moist till you prepare the baby and take up for surgery okay so this my friends is bladder extrophy i'm sure you've marked it correctly so there is a spelling mistake here bladder extrophy okay so moving ahead to the next question what you have here so this is question number 3 a 5 day old neonate okay who has not passed urine so this is a 5 day old neonate who has not passed urine since birth okay is brought to the emergency what would be the next step so if a baby has not passed urine for 24 hours i think there is some confusion in this question some students mentioned that it was mentioned that the neonate has not passed urine for last 24 hours so if it is mentioned that neonate has not passed urine for last 24 hours then this fits in the definition of acute kidney injury in fact it is the most severe stage of acute kidney injury where the where there is anuria for more than 12 hours so this baby probably has acute kidney injury okay and that is a medical emergency we need to manage it continue breastfeeding and observe we cannot just sit and observe this baby okay we need to do more than that shift to nicu neonatal invest intensive care unit and investigate yes we need to investigate this baby what is the cause of acute kidney injury okay and we have to see the urea creatinine levels of the baby we have to see the volume status of the child whether the child is in fluid overload or you know the child is dehydrated the baby is dehydrated that is why there is no urine output or there is some other intrinsic renal injury because of some you know nephrotoxic drugs or any other toxins okay we need to figure that out start iv fluids immediately we might need to give a fluid challenge here but you know we first have to make sure that the baby is not in fluid overload or heart failure so we first have to make sure about the volume status of the child and then only we will give a fluid challenge and after giving a fluid challenge you know if the baby passes urine fine if the baby does not pass urine then we need to actually restrict you know fluid 
to insensible losses. 400 ml per meter square per 24 hours. Okay, that is what you need to give along with you know replacement of urine output if there is any. So shift to NICU and investigate is the best option out of the given options which I got. So if there are any other options or any other modification in the question, please let me know. Okay, so we can revise it and rediscuss it accordingly. Moving ahead to the fourth question. So what we have here is a 11 month old baby, okay, a 11 month old baby who was brought with a history of incessant crying, that means the baby is going on crying and on examination a tender mass was palpable in the right lumbar region, okay, a image of the barium enema study that was done is shown below and what do you see in this barium enema study? So what we see here is, you know, a claw like image, so this is what is typically known as a claw sign, okay. A claw sign is what you get in, you do not get it in duodenal atresia, volvulus, you get it in intersusception and you do not get it in pyloric stenosis. So this friends typically is an image of the claw sign and you know when do you suspect intersusception? So clinically you suspect intersusception when you get a triad of three things. So the baby may have you know incessant abdominal pain. So the baby may have incessant crying okay because of the abdominal pain. Or it can be episodic, okay, episodic colicky pain is what is usually there. Plus, you can get red current or current jelly-like stool, okay. Some blood in stools can also be there, mucosa, mucus in stools can also be there. So, current jelly stools plus a tender palpable sausage-shaped abdominal mass, okay. So, this is the typical triad that you get in intersusception, okay. So, this again is a very important question, a very important topic which we've already discussed in our videos. Moving ahead, so regarding high risk infants, which of the following are correct? Birth weight less than 2.5 kgs, birth order more than 3, single parent, top feeding, birth weight below 85th percentile. So let us see what are the features of high risk infant or what are the risk factors which make a baby high risk. Now what do you mean by high risk baby? High risk infant is an infant who is more at risk of developing complications or morbidity and mortality as compared to the other normal babies, okay, as compared to their healthier counterparts. So there are some risk factors which make the baby high risk. There are some maternal or social factors like if the mother is too young, age less than 16 years or if the mother is elderly more than 40 years of age or if the mother is having any illicit drug use like cocaine, alcohol or smoking, poverty, unmarried status of the mother or a single parent is again another you know uh, factor which has been seen to make the baby high risk short interpregnancy times if the pregnancies are spaced very closely that, then that also imposes a risk maternal diseases like diabetes hypertension or if the mother has any rheumatological illness okay factors related to previous pregnancy which make this baby high risk are previous history of intrauterine death or death in the neonatal period previous history of a baby having IUGR intrauterine growth restriction okay Prematurity in the previous baby, high drops in the previous baby, congenital malformations or inborn errors of metabolism in the previous baby. Factors related to present pregnancy which make this uh, infant high risk are vaginal bleeding during pregnancy, presence of multiple gestation that means twin, triplet, quadruplets and so on, preeclampsia in the mother, premature rupture of membrane, presence of poly or oligohydramnios during pregnancy and during labor if there is you know premature labor or postdated labor or if there is fetal distress during labor breach delivery, presence of meconium stain fluid, assisted delivery or cesarean section also make the baby high risk. Now there are some factors related to the neonate which are often asked in questions like this, the current question also. So birth weight of a baby if it is less than 2500 grams that means a low birth weight baby or if the birth weight is more than 4000 grams that imposes high risk to the baby. Birth less than 37 weeks of gestation or greater than equal to 42 weeks of gestation that means preterm or postterm baby again a high risk okay. Apart from that, if the baby is small or large for gestational age, then it poses a higher risk. Respiratory distress in the baby, presence of congenital malformations and presence of any of the three Ps, pallor, plethora or petechiae, okay, that means thrombocytopenia. So these are conditions which make the baby high risk, okay. Moving back to the question, the options which I could get, let us, you know, discuss them. So regarding high risk infants, which of the following are correct? Birth weight less than 2.5 kg, yes, that makes a baby high risk. Birth order more than 3, so Nelson. The latest edition does not specify anything about the birth order making a baby high risk. However, short interpregnancy intervals has been a, confirmed to be a risk factor making the baby high risk. Okay, Single parent, yes, being a single parent or an unmarried mother is a risk factor. Top feeding again has not been mentioned among the risk of risk factor, among the list of risk factors. Birth weight below 85th percentile. 
So, you know, a small for date baby or large for date is mentioned as risk factors. So, so small for date baby we know is a baby whose birth weight is less than 10 percentile of expected according to the gestational age. Okay. While large for date we know is birth weight more than 90th percentile of expected according to the gestational age. So, birth weight below 85th percentile is not a risk. Birth weight less than 10th percentile of expected that means small for date baby would have made this baby high risk infant. Okay. So, these are the best answers out of the options that I could get. Okay. Moving ahead to the next question. What we have here is a 6 year old girl with anemia. And this anemia worsens with episodes of infections requiring multiple blood transfusions. So, looks like a chronic anemia. Okay. And is uh, like quite severe requiring multiple blood transfusions. This girl presented with fever and painful swelling of her right knee. So, fever and painful swelling of one joint. Okay. So, and her peripheral smear picture is shown below. What do you see in this peripheral smear? So, in this peripheral smear, we can clearly make out these sickle-shaped RBCs. Can you see these sickle-shaped RBCs? So, this child is suffering from sickle cell disease. And we know to diagnose sickle cell disease, you can do hemoglobin electrophoresis or HPLC of hemoglobin. Okay, that will show you HBS peak. Or you can even do the sickle mutation, okay, in the globin gene, right? So, what is the most likely organism isolated from the fluid aspirated from a knee joint? So, this question, you know, it is a pretty straightforward, simple question, but it again needs you to synthesize this information. First, come to a diagnosis of sickle cell disease. Then, we, the case scenario looks like, you know, fever and swelling, painful swelling of the knee joint. So, this looks like a case of osteomyelitis can be a possibility. Septic arthritis also can be a possibility. Okay. So, if there is, you know, osteomyelitis in a child with sickle cell disease, then the most common organism responsible is salmonella. Otherwise, you know, in children, most common organism responsible for sickle cell disease is Staphylococcus aureus. But in children with sickle cell disease, salmonella is quite common. Okay. So, out of the given options, salmonella appears to be the best choice. Okay. Right. Moving ahead to the next question. A two-year-old pre-morbidly normal, okay, pre-morbidly normal two-year-old child, okay, so a well-thriving child, that means the weight gain and all was also proper, presented with sudden onset of breathing difficulty. So, sudden onset breathing difficulty while playing. So, something must have happened during playing that suddenly, you know, the baby developed respiratory distress. Chest x-ray of this child showed right-sided hyperinflation. So, one-sided hyperinflation with normal left lung. So, one sided lung is hyperinflated, other side is normal and it is the right side which, is, which is, appears to be hyperinflated. Which of the following statements is true regarding the case? So, this you know friends clearly appears to be a case of foreign body aspiration which is quite common in this age group. Okay, In this age group of you know 2 to 5 years it is quite common and it is more common on the right side because the right bronchus we know is more straighter. Okay, And why hyperinflation occurs is? You know, there can be a partial obstruction of the bronchus. Okay, the larger airways, if there is a partial obstruction, there is a ball valve-like mechanism that happens. You know, that means the air is able to go inside the lungs, but the air is not able to come back. So, there is trapping of air in the lungs and there is hyperinflation, which is typically seen and unilateral findings are seen usually in this foreign body aspiration. And this history is so typical that, you know, suddenly the child who has otherwise well-developed breathlessness. Okay, so this clinical scenario plus the chest extra picture points towards the diagnosis of foreign body aspiration. Now, let us go through the options. The child has developed acute laryngotracheal bronchitis. No, acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, the child will have some prodromal features, low grade fever, cough, coryza and all can be there. And there can be development of strider in the child. Okay, so this does not appear to be a case of acute laryngotracheal bronchitis. Focal area of decreased air entry will confirm the diagnosis. So, focal area of decreased air entry can be due to many reasons. It can be due to collapse of the lung. But you know, this collapse of the lung, if it is present, it is not confirming of the, our diagnosis. Our diagnosis here is foreign body aspiration, okay? So, this does not appear to be the best choice. In complete obstruction, ball valve mechanism leads to such condition. So, complete obstruction, my friends, will, will produce a collapse of the lung. Will not produce hyperinflation due to the ball valve mechanism, okay? So, this again is not a correct statement. Bronchoscopic removal is the management of choice, yes. So, if there is a foreign body aspiration in a child, we need to take up the child to the OT and, you know, under sedation or anesthesia, bronchoscopic removal of the foreign body is what is required. Okay. So, moving on to the next question. We have a five-year child with a history of recurrent urinary infections. Okay. Who presented to the pediatrics OPD and this child was evaluated. The image of a micturating cystourethrogram is shown below. What is the probable diagnosis? 
So what you see in this image of micturating cystoeurethrogram is the bladder appears to be dilated. Bilateral ureters are also dilated. And in micturating cystoeurethrogram, what you do is you insert a foley and you insert dive or contrast from below. And you can see that the dilated and tortuous bladder and dilated pelvis of the kidney and the calluses are seen. Okay, and the bladder is dilated, bilateral findings are there. So, this is suggestive of a ves vesicoureteric reflux, okay. Bladder retention is there, yes, but that is not the only finding here. So, this is not the best choice. Ectopic kidney, no. The kidneys do not appear to be ectopic here, it does not. So, vesicoureteric reflux bilateral is the best choice out of the given options. And micturating cystoeurethrogram is often done either to look for posterior urethral valve, okay, so dilated posterior urethra you can get or you can look at the VUR which is a very, very common cause of recurrent urinary tract infections in children, okay. Moving on to the next question. So, this my friends is the 10th question. A child who presented to OPD with multiple episodes of loose stools, okay. So, diarrhea is so, so, so important topic. We've discussed it so many times in our videos also, in the MCQ marathon also. So, you know, diarrhea is a must, must know topic. We all know that. I'm sure all of you have answered this correctly. So, a child presented to OPD with multiple episodes of loose stools, he's not able to drink anything. Capillary refill rate is very slow. Actually, I think here, what was mentioned was the skin turgor. So, the skin turgor is very slow was what was probably mentioned. The skin pinch or skin turgor, please uh, write in the comments below. I think it is the skin pinch or the recoil of the skin after pinching. That was, you know, very slow. It's probably what was mentioned. Which grade of dehydration this child has? So, let us discuss a little bit about the assessment of dehydration in a child with diarrhea, which we have discussed n number of times, okay? So, we know sensorium. In no dehydration, the child will be well active and alert. In some dehydration, the child may be dull and lethargic. And in severe dehydration, the child is, you know, very, very lethargic and almost comatose. The child may be very lethargic and comatose, okay? Right? Altered sensorium can be there. Thirst, normal in no dehydration, very thirsty in some dehydration and the child is not able to drink. So, not able to drink indicates severe dehydration, okay? Like we are getting in the current case scenario also. So, skin pinch in no dehydration, it goes back quickly. So, if you pinch up a fold of skin on the abdomen, it goes back quickly when there is no dehydration. It goes back slowly but taking less than 2 seconds in some dehydration. But it goes back very slowly, taking more than 2 seconds in severe dehydration. So, again here in this question, the skin recoil also probably was mentioned that it is going back very slowly. Okay. Mucosa, it remains normal or moist in no dehydration, dry in some dehydration, very dry in severe dehydration. This is a bit subjective, you know. Eyes are normal again in no dehydration while sunken in some dehydration, very sunken in severe dehydration. Tears present in no dehydration and they are absent in some or severe dehydration. So, as we've mentioned, if the patient has two or more signs including at least one of the signs in mentioned in inverted commas, that means either the sensorium is altered or if the child is not able to drink or breastfeed, or if the skin pinch is going back very slowly, then the child has severe dehydration. So, moving back to our question, what we have here is a child with multiple episodes of loose stools, that means acute diarrhea, is not able to drink, that indicates severe dehydration. And capillary refill time is also very slow, if it was mentioned, the skin pinch is also going back very slowly. All these are pointers towards severe dehydration and in severe dehydration, we know we have to give IV correction. So, we have to give use ideal fluid to be used as ringal acted in 5% dextrose and you have to give 100 ml per kg fluid to correct severe dehydration at different rates depending on whether the child's age is less than one year or more than one year, okay? So, these friends were some 10 questions which we could, I could, you know, get recalled questions till now from pediatrics. I'm sure there are many more. So, please, if you are able to recall any other questions, please mention in the chat box below. And I am sure all of you must have answered these questions correctly. And all of you must have performed in this exam to the best of your expectations. So, all the very best for your results. I am sure you will get the dream branch of your choice. All the very best. God bless you. Thank you.